So we're going to get into the first formal item now, um, confirmation of appointments. So if we get to that particular agenda item, I just need to put that there. Okay, so you have the paper. It's going to be the sort of new rule. I'm not going to present it. You have the paper in front of you. Um, I want to just tease out the fact that uh, in here, this is making it clear as part of the unitary board from a statute perspective, there are a group of board members. Then we have a group of partner and board participants and board attendees. And I just want to sort of state, state the obvious that in, in order for us to make this function, um, we just need to be really clear, as I said, about colleagues' roles. So, so Debbie, for example, um, Debbie, you're going to be representing all of mental health representation on this board. And the reason why I'm going to sort of say some of this and people are going to go, why is he saying that? We all know that. It's because some people don't know this quite yet. They haven't read the documents in full, or haven't grasped it or haven't been in you know, meetings long enough. So I'm trying to be helpful. So the ones who get it, I apologise. The ones who haven't got it, I hope it's landing for you. So there's something here about Steve will be representing um, all the NHS providers uh, in this space. And that's really important because I'm going to challenge Debbie not to, well, I'm sure you will on occasions, but try not to be CFT. Steve, try not to actually be RCHT. Um, I'm going to, Alison, who will be joining us from the council, uh, she starts today, I think. She's actually uh, Alison Bullman, but she's at her council meetings, I assume, today. So from her perspective, she'll be, and, and it's agreed with um, the Isles of Silly that, that she will represent both councils on here. And Andy, who has sent his apologies, who's one of our three MDs, of course, Andy will be the representative as a partner member for primary medical care. He won't be here as the MD or GP or whatever. So I just wanted to say it such that if, if I or you feel they're deferring back into old behaviours, etc., let's just help our colleagues and do that. Okay. The other thing to just tease out from this board pack is uh, the board champions that are in here. Yeah. They're happy with her to tease that out. So I hope you spotted that, because um, other than burying it in a um, board pack, somehow we've got to make sure that people are aware that these champions are here, and there'll be other people outside these rooms who need to know that you are the champion. So on another day, we need to think, colleagues, about how you, as the champions, make yourself known to others that you are the champions. Okay? So, okay, is there anything on this particular paper that you would like to add? Not at all. Trudy? Um, it would just be really helpful to minute, John, that the appointments committee met prior to the board yeah. um, and the non-exec members and the execs of the ICB have been appointed prior to this meeting in accordance with day one arrangements. Everybody happy to know that? Well done. Thank you very much. So in this particular paper, it asks for the formal appointments to be made to the ICB, its board and, and wider roles. Can I just take that as a everyone is happy with that just for the minutes this is the dry part of the day this is going to be lots of are you happy with it yes minute it away we go yes mario uh, thanks chair um i just it's a question really um this process is an integration process uh, a key partner is the local authority um in in this i just wondered what the uh what the decision thinking was behind just having one uh, from what I can see, one local authority representative who isn't even here at the meeting. Yes, OK. Um, so, Alison, well, there's two questions there. The, the first is, as part of the legislation uh, and part of the discussions with NHSEI, we were encouraged to have representatives as opposed to everyone in every constituent element being represented. Because if not, you'll end up with about 45 people around this table. And the idea is, as I was trying to, to make the point about, Debbie is going to represent not just CFT's mental health, but actually represent mental health providers. So the, the trick, that when it came down to the local authorities, for those who aren't aware of this, um, the nomination process was invited out to both councils to say, please go away and choose who you would like to represent both your organisations on this board. And they coalesced behind it being uh, Alison, who is the brand new well-being director for Cornwall Council and representing them. But what we then decided on top of that, because that's a statutory role, on top of that, Paul Masters is actually meant to be here. Um, I don't know quite why 
he sent his apologies, but uh, Paul is on our board as a participant. So we did sneak him in um, on the basis that Isles of Silly would be nice to have their representative in the room as well. Okay. And of course, Rachel, would you double up on? Thank you for <laughs> correcting me on that. Absolutely. You're a, you're a two, two cap. So. Okay. So I'm going to uh, go for it. Thank you. I mean, there's obviously an agreement around that representation, but on review of some of the other memberships of ICBs in some of the other unitary authorities, I just sort of wanted to note that um, directors of public health in Somerset, Gloucestershire, which are sort of a criminal equivalent, are full members of the board. Um, and I know it's something that we've looked at in terms of balance. And, you know, of course, I'm, you know, I'm always welcome to these boards and participate fully, but I think it might be something we want to review in the future as we see how the board progresses yeah, around yeah, right. that balance of full membership by the director given the objectives of the icb so just just my point for sure thank you in fact i think one of the things we will talk about is quite when we do a full review actually of all this because there's no point pressing on if it's not working and we might choose to do all sorts of things differently so let's agree if it's functioning but we need to tweak it we'll have a staging point if it's clearly not functioning we'll get to it earlier everybody up for that very yes I, th I think one of the um areas of balance that we've tried to um seek in, in terms of establishing the board for day one is to make sure that it's not too big so it can function as a board not a workshop but that it's still got the right representation around the table um, and as a collective as a unitary board we are all jointly and severally responsible for what we do so um that will be something that's part of our development as we move forward that we'll need to um, consider how we do that. Um, and I think if we were a more complicated part of the country, um, the representative, well, the roles of councils and who is um, is on the ICB would be, um, I think, clearer to see. But because we've got one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, we do um, duplicate in places um, our relative roles and responsibilities so i think that's just something we're going to have to work through over the next um six months to a year agreed so um on top of that there are a couple of other points i wanted to tease out of here um so we're happy with the um the non-execs we're happy with the split of uh at this stage we're happy with the split of uh, unitary uh formal members uh, board participants and attendees. We're happy with the champions. Um, I would just ask, uh, when you get to page six of this particular paper, um, we do please um, re request that those who would like to have a substitute nominate this such. It's fine for today, but we want to go to a position where if you, either it's you, or if you don't nominate a substitute from the 14th of July, I would request that you don't send somebody unless we know who it is and it's your formal substitute, please. All right. So most people are on page six have nominated it, um, but as it's day one, let's all just move on. Everybody happy with, with that process? Before we finish, anything you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. Good. Again, just as a style thing, just a bit of a metronome that I'm going to be, I'll always turn to the chief executive and basically say, are you happy with this before we get to a conclusion? So you're happy with it. So are we all happy with it? Yeah, good. Right, let's move on. So, um, bear with me. Yeah, so we're up to five now. Okay, so the introductions from, from each of you. So, um, I'm not quite sure if you all know each other, really. So, precisely, thank you for the, uh, the visual aid there, Mary. So, so, what I want to try and do is, I've, I've put ten minutes in here, just to allow you to have to break the ice a bit and just you, don't take five minutes else it's all right all right but let's just go around the table and just say who you are please so Mary why don't you kick off yeah microphones is a challenge thank you I'm Mary Anson I'm the independent care provider sector representative thank I'm you. also chair of Cornwall Partners in Care can I just say that it's not community partners in care as in the papers, it's Cornwall Partners in Care. Thank you. We'll take that. Thank you. Trudy? Hello, I'm Sarah Newton, and I'm a non-executive director of the Royal Cornwall Hospital Trust. Thank you. I'm standing in for our chair, Maureen McLean. 
Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name's Tim Bishop. I'm one of the executive directors from SWAS Southwestern Ambulance. Uh, we cover, of course, the seven ICSs in the Southwest, and we've got a match between uh, our executive director group and each of the ICSs. So myself and many of my colleagues are in similar forums uh, today, uh, coming along there. Uh, and I've got the strategic link uh, into the Cornwall system, uh, recognizing obviously where we are at the moment, the opportunities that we've got uh, to be distinctive from the operational delivery, uh, which my colleague in the county, Jeff Griffin, leads. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Susan Bracefield. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for the newly formed Integrated Care Board, and very pleased to be here for the first week. Very so, good. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel O'Connor. Um, I'm the Director for Inclusion um, with uh, the ICB. Uh, my portfolio includes, I have a great privilege of, of looking after the commissioning portfolio uh, for Cornwall and the Isle of Scilly, but also taking forward our agenda around building our place, our ICA work, um, and look forward to working with you all. Thank you. And just before we move on, just to make the point, so everyone knows, the three managing directors at place level report into you, don't That's they? correct, yes. Thanks. Good morning. I got caught out with the A30 being shut yes, uh, westbound okay. at uh, Chiverton Cross, which backed up towards the hospital. So my apologies for, right. for being late. I'm Steve Williamson, Chief Executive of Royal Cornwall Hospitals NHS Trust. Uh, although I'm here in my role as a, a representative of, of NHS providers, so I'm here jointly on behalf of SWAST, CFT, RCHT, uh, and University Hospital Plymouth as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Just, just before we move on, again, I want to say it again, really important, you're here in your capacity of representing NHS providers. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Neil Walden. Um, I'm non-executive member of the board and my responsibility is to chair the Primary Care Commissioning Committee and the new ICA Committee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Theobald and I'm a non-executive member of the board as well. And uh, I'm chairing two committees, Quality and Pathways of Care and Citizen Engagement and Equalities. And in my day job, I am the Chief Executive of Eyesight Cornwall, a local charity. Good morning. I'm Sandra Canton. I'm also a non-executive member and I chair the Finance, Performance and Commissioning Committee. And I am also in the day job uh, CEO of Shelterbox. And my other responsibilities are also for sustainability and environment and vice chair, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, apologies for being late. I knew you'd put me right at the front since I was coming in late. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Martin Sykes, um, obviously one of the non-executive members, and um, I'll be chairing the audit committee, member of the finance committee with Sanj, and member of the integrated care area committees with, with Neil. Um, so I'm Kate Shields, I'm the chief exec of the integrated care board, and I don't have to say designate for the first time in 11 months, which is very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm really excited, excited that today has come, and particularly in the backdrop to the last three days, actually. First day with the um, Voluntary Sector Forum Conference in Red Ruth, and then two days at uh, Newquay with our collective of people across Cornwall who um, are coming together to genuinely make a difference. Um, and I, um, I feel so heartened that one of our um, oh, people who are interested in Cornwall left yesterday um, saying that he thought it was the first time we'd ever been with people in a room where he really thought we meant it um, and that the language we used and the way we worked together gave him heart that things were going to change. So um, it's a brilliant way for us to start our first board meeting and um, I'm looking forward to, to us doing just that. Simon Davis, Chief Finance Officer for the ICB. Also uh, delighted to be working with partners across the system and to uh, move things forward. And, uh, and I entirely agree, last two days was really, uh, really helpful and interesting. And it felt like we were starting to move in a, in a really good direction. And, ju and just to add, besides the obvious responsibilities, I also pick up and we'll be focusing more on estates and digital as part of my remit. So I, I hope to bring some more of that through to the board in future. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. My name's Tarn Lamb. I'm one of the non-exec members. Um, I have specific responsibility for workforce and for Remcom, um, and I'm also the champion for equalities. 
And my day job, I run a charity in Cornwall called Cornwall Neighbourhoods for Change. It's a community development organisation. And I also have another job for one day a week, which is that I'm on the National Lottery Community Fund England Committee and help them to set their strategic direction. I can't yeah. reach either. Morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Andrews, as of today, Director of um, Transformation and Partnerships. Um, really looking forward to working with everybody and just to echo brilliant last couple of days. It was amazing. Um, as of today, my portfolio um, includes the partnership working piece, um, governance, engagement and comms, climate resilience, um, strategy and planning. Um, and for the next few months, those uh, strategy pieces and some of the governance pieces are probably going to be my focus because um, from an ICS perspective and an ICB perspective, although we've transitioned, uh, obviously today, there are still some outstanding pieces of work that we have to do for that transition with NHSC and I um, with some guidance that's only literally come out in the last couple of days. So uh, we're still on that uh, that kind of transition piece. Morning everyone, um, I'm Rachel Wigglesworth, I'm Director of Public Health that covers um, both Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and it's a statutory post that's uh, appointed by the Secretary of State for Health, so uh, I am an independent role. Um, my duties are around improving the health of the population, protecting it and reducing health inequalities. Thank you. Uh, morning everyone, uh, Patrick Weir, Director of Workforce and OD for the Integrated Care Board, no longer designate as of today, which is uh, equally exciting. Uh, my role is to help develop uh, an integrated workforce strategy across our health care system in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. I'm looking forward to doing just that. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Helen Skinner, I'm the uh, new Chief Medical Officer um, and as mentioned uh, I'm now in I think hour two um, of, of the job. Uh, very exciting to uh, be joining um, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly um, from New Zealand, um, I couldn't really go any further. Um, very excited to have been immersed um, in the direction of travel and a uh, really exciting journey from the last two days so uh, a huge thank you to everyone for the warm welcome um, over the last couple of days. I'm Margaret Schwartz, I'm Chair of uh, Cornwall Partnership Trust. Thanks, Mario. Um, I'm Emma Ridgewell Howard, and I'm the Chief Executive of Kerno Local Medical Committee, which is the statutory representative of general practice. We're a membership organisation, try to stay as independent as we can, but that's our lens. So, And, and it was a brilliant couple of days, so thank you for, for, uh, for letting us be part. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Mario Dunn. I'm the Chief Executive of Health Watch Cornwall. Health Watch uh, has a statutory role which uh, was defined in the legislation that created the ICS or ICBs, ICPs, uh, and I'm here to make sure that you keep that commitment to put the public and the patient at the front and centre of all you do. And Debbie. Yes, good morning everyone. I'm, I'm Debbie Richards. I'm Chief Executive of Cornwall Foundation Partnership Trust, but I am here in my capacity as a partner member for mental health. And I think relevant to that, I'm a, a mental health social worker by professional background and training. And I retain, proudly retain my registration and I have a considerable um, professional career in both mental health, learning disabilities, and autism provision and commissioning across a number of systems and including work on provider collaboratives and extensive partnership working with the third and voluntary sector to deliver care in partnership. Thank you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I did set the scene, didn't I, really, earlier on? <laughs> Patrick, uh, just a small point I should have picked up earlier on. In terms of particularly our four partner members, can you just make sure for the formalities that you actually get everyone's letters back and signed? Because until it's signed, um, you're not quite over the line. I should have said that. All right, so with all the best of intent, happy with you, but please just get, get a bit of paperwork done, please. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Anything you'd like on that item? No, yeah. other than um, welcome to everybody, and um, I can't wait for us to develop our um, unique personality as a board. Very good. Okay, let, colleagues, let's move on to item six. So, Kate, over to you. It's about the Constitution. It's about the Constitution, and um, I have your words ringing in my ears, John, in terms of uh, that personal... Thank you. Um, it's contagious. Um, so I have your words ringing in my ears, John, around the Constitution. So I'm going to assume that everybody's read it rather than me going yep. through it slavishly. Um, and I'd be, I'm asking the board to receive the ICB's Constitution and to note that any change to this document require approval by NHS um, England. So I'd like to take any comments, please, and we will take draft off the top yes, um, after today. Thank you, Trude. I think there have been some points that were picked up since the papers went out. So. Oh, right. Sorry, yes, I That's right. So um, Martin and... Um, um, Martin Sykes and Brian Jacobson, because we've had everything legally reviewed, spotted an error in paragraph 3.11.9, um, which refers to the senior ind independent director um, not being able to chair the audit committee. It should read the vice chair. So we will um, change that in the uh, next version. Um, and um, that's it in terms of... Um, Is another one, because uh, NHS England have already approved that change, Kate. It okay. will be uh, made on the website next week. Thank you very much. Okay. Nothing else to be changed, though. Unless colleagues have spotted there was, anything that there was. Yeah. There were two typos in it that kind okay. of a referencing Thank error and kind of something something that. really minor. So that's been changed Didn't as well. Your hand up. Oh, that was yeah. perfect. Thank you for reading it. Yes. <laughs> it shows people ready. And, and just so you get the insight, uh, we had to work with NHSEI to, to change the um, chair and, and senior independent director. Out. We had to work with NHSEI to change the uh, chair and vice chair around, hence why we actually missed that particular paragraph. So I just wanted to recognise that and, and thank Sanj and Martin for your support uh, in switching that around as well with your consent. So I wanted to recognise that. So we're going to the recommendation. Yes, so the recommendation. Sorry, sorry. Yes, it's difficult to swivel my head this night. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I will just, just jump in. Um, I just no, I, I tried to click on the links within the, the specific document I've got, and they didn't work, so I think there's a broken link oh. in the links to all the further background documents, just, just to check that. Helpful. And can I just make a request to have the, um, the title Director of Public Health, not Public Health Director. It's a bit like saying uh, Office of Nursing Director, because that's the role, if that's okay, just to amend that. Yeah. Director of Public Health. Yes. That's okay. And then can I just make a comment? There's one um, bit that says, I think it's um, 2.3.6, which is around if you are a participant of the board in a private session where the public is not invited, you may be asked to leave, which I understand because participants aren't full members of the board. Um, but And then the second paragraph after that says, you know, but the chair may invite them to stay. So I just, just was interested in, in that as a, as a sort of the members who are participants, which include Health Watch, um, that, that whereby, you know, we would hope that wouldn't happen, wouldn't we? And I, I, I see that is in there, but I felt uncomfortable that I might be okay, asked. Good to question. Truly, can you help a, us a, with an answer? Private session. I think it's it's standard practice. Rachel, my expectation is, and if you want, and I think if we're in approval to minute it today, is that those people that are sitting around this table in part one will be part of part two as well. And it's it's, it's just the way it's been written. Yes. I, th I think that's an important point because we're either a board or we're not. So um, if we're a board, we're a board in part one and part two. So um, subject, I, I just want to check that we're not going to distress anybody nationally by removing a very important point from our constitution and if we're not then we as a board need to define our um how we work so my preference kate if that's all right because actually getting the constitution change is really difficult at this stage because it's already been agreed by nhs england my preference would be to minute it as part of this inaugural meeting and demonstrate that yes that that is the kind of that is what we're signing up to and are you happy with that that was the resolution I'm happy with that. I think that should be part of the review process. Yes, I um, agree, uh, agree, uh, agree, agree. But uh, I wanted to raise it. Thank you. And, and Rachel, I, I think if we can carry, some of you know me well, I, I love minuting things so that we can hold ourselves collectively to what we said going forward. So when we come to do the review, we'll certainly be in the minutes and we'll pick this up when we do that. Can we coalesce behind that as then agreement of the contract? And I have to say, <coughs> it's not been without its challenges trying to get this constitution together, bearing in mind the church if you think about it, with a small c, they've had to actually sign up to it. So 
I'm not going to say thank you an awful lot today, but if I can't do it today, I'm never going to do it going forward. So thank you again to everyone part of this to get to this point. So, minuted, done. Thank you. Happy Kate? Yeah, lovely. lovely. Right, let's move on, colleagues. So, Kate, we're on to your next section, which is the safe transition of Kerno NHS to the ICB. You have in front of you um, um, a high-level document that describes the steps that we've gone through um, to move the legal entity that was Kerno CCG into the legal ent entity of Cornwall and Isles Silly ICB. Um, on page three, there's a slight amendment that I would like to um, advise the board about that we are going to start um, an external audit in the next week to make sure that we've moved safely all of our statutory functions from the CCG into the ICB and that we've established ourselves in accordance with good governance and best practice. Um, and we will have um, an external audit on our setup and our operating when we get to October. My understanding is NHSINE may then want us to share the findings of that audit so that they can be clear that we are um, good for good for operating. Um, our readiness to operate um, checklists have been signed off and in terms of um, the national um, support for us starting to operate as a legal entity, um, John and I have both got letters from NHSINE um, confirming that they are I'm happy with our progress and that we are ready to operate um, according to the legislation. So um, in terms of my uh, recommendation to the board, um, that um, I'd like you to um, support the ongoing development of our integrated care board um, and ensure that the work has commenced has given the impetus to continue. As Carolyn said, we're not finished yet. We've still got um, um, things to land on the other side of transition. Um, we're going to um, commission an extension of our transition oversight group until March. So as we find things, we have a, a structure in place to be able to deal with them. And we will um, give regular updates from the transition team to the board so that you know where we are in terms of any changes we need to make. Um, that's just if everybody's happy with that. Okay, so before we get into the recommendations themselves... Am I able to leave it on? <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, before we get into the recommendations, as we start getting into the substance of some of these things now, um, I need to give you the opportunity to, to make any comments if you wish to. It's not just about ticking a box here. So is there anything on this particular item in terms of transfer? Because this is important stuff, because we're taking on responsibility, everyone. Any issues that you want to raise? Martin. Thanks, John. I thought I'd just feed in, since I was part of the transitional operational group um, thus far, so, A, you know, welcome that carrying on because I think there's still some work to do. It would be great that we can continue that process probably by meeting every month. Um, probably fair to say that, you know, looking at the process thus far, I think it's been great. Um, I think we can get a good degree of assurance from some level of external assurance. Our internal auditors have been doing it. Um, the sort of regional people have been all over it. We've had standard documentation to go through in terms of, re you know, ready to operate statements, due diligence statements. Probably should add, though, John, it's not actually a full due diligence as you would probably know no. you know from the commercial sector so yeah, yeah you know have we ticked all the boxes yes um you know are there still likely to be things that need you know correcting mm. changing a bit in the new world almost certainly yes so most of the risks have been mitigated but you know there will still be some risks there so i have to say you know welcome the, the work we're going to do i think it's absolutely right to um carry on with the terms you know the transitional operational group um start to do a review now of the way we've set the new organization up and you know in the fullness of time have that full sort of not full due diligence but full governance review so that we can just tweak things to make sure we are absolutely correct uh, going forward with the new world Rachel. thanks john i think it would be really helpful in the work that's been done a bit of a lessons learned in terms of what went well and what didn't go well. The reason being is as we go through the year, there will be other things that start to um, have discussions about transition, particularly in areas such as dentistry, optometry that we will go through. So we'll have other things that potentially may transition into the ICB. So learning from, in terms of the work that's been done, how we can apply that as we go through those questions through the years and that due diligence, I think I personally would find really helpful to build on that work so far. We've actually started to do that, Rachel, just for the board's assurance, because it is important that we learn from this process. Um, so we've already got somebody beginning to kind of pull the what went well, what didn't go so well, and then going out to 
the wider organisation to kind of get some feedback from there. So we are looking at that evaluation. And in part, that's why, Rachel, that we're bringing in external scrutiny now. So um, there will be some risks that need immediate management between the CCG ending and the ICB starting. And there were things that we find during the first couple of months of operating. So um, we just want to put a structured framework in place so that we can hold everything in one place. So just to add before we get into the meat of the, the recommendations is that um, we've done some really great stuff to get here. As I, I think I've said a couple of times beforehand. I, I think if I just look back and, and, and Kane, I know we wanted to do this and I'm still, I'm not going to look back, I'm going to look forward, but I think we would have ideally liked to have actually had not just the CCG's perspective on it, but already have had our external piece of work done. Um, and for whatever reason, let's not go into it now, we've just wasted energy. We weren't able to do that but is that then the piece of work that you're about to commission yes so it'll be an immediate transfer um risks on transfer and how we're setting ourselves up so we set ourselves up safely and then we'll have another external review that nhsi &E will want in october because everybody will be having one of those and um, that will confirm that we've established ourselves well as a um a, a legal entity yeah okay but i think there's something there about um it's not that we don't trust the, the previous group respon responsible, but we are a new statutory board and we should take our own view on this. And therefore, we have faith that the work has been done well, because a lot of those people who were doing that are now this side of the fence as well. But I think it's just really good practice to do that. And what we're also going to do, I believe, Kate, is that when that review is going to be done, it'll be part of a wider governance review as well, Absolutely. looking at the whole wiring. because. When we get later on into the discussions about what we've set up, taking almost, Rachel, what you were saying in terms of a, a review, the wiring that we've put in place and committees and diggity diggity kind of thing, we might get a bit down the wire, even three months down the wire and go, it seems such a fab idea six months ago. <laughs> yeah. And we may have missed some bits or we may have inherited some bits we haven't spotted or, I mean, we're also pretty good at adding stuff and forgetting to stop stuff. And there might be, there might still be a whole group of people who think they're in power to stop whatever we want that happen, kind of thing. Um, I can think of a few already, but I'm not going to get into that now. All right. Okay. So on to the recommendation then. Um, let's go to these recommendations. So on page two of the report is to commission an extension of the tran transition oversight group until March 23. I take it you're all supportive of that. Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Second recommendation request regular updates of the transition team to the board. Well, you can read it for yourself. You happy with that second recommendation? Yes. Done. Thank you. Please minute that, Trudy. And we're away. Done. Thank you so much. Let's move on to item eight. Kate, over to you on office accommodation, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, so when COVID hit, the CCG um, decided to dispense with the headquarters um, in St. Austell for the CCG and kept a number of dispersed um, um, premises around <laughs> Cornwall. Um, I think that's worked while people were working ostensibly from their homes and then going into hot desking space around the county. Um, but we are cognizant that a new organisation has to have an identity for the people that work in it. Um, and part of that identity is where you go to work or where you have your team meetings. We don't currently have anywhere that we can gather together large groups of um, ICB staff. Um, we also want to make um, a statement really early on that we are part of an integrated system of delivery in Cornwall. The ICB doesn't sit on its own. We're a, we're a networked organisation across the county. Um, and so we want to um, base ourselves in council offices so that there's a real link between health and the social determinants of health that the council um, has ostensibly got responsibility for. Um, so this paper... Um, talks about us um, having a headquarters in Chai Travail in Bodmin. So we're trying to reduce the amount of upheaval for our people because the, the base for CCG staff was St. Austell. Um, we're also going to have a base at New County Hall and that's so that we're next to the councillors and to uh, be along with local authority colleagues um, and that we will retain Carlion House um, in St. Austell. We went and talked to our people about it and they are some some disquiet for people who live in the west of Cornwall because none of those facilities are anywhere near the west. So um, in your paper on page three you have appendix one which talks about the um, potential of saving 245,000 through as rationalising the estate. Um, with the support of the board I would like to um, do a um, 
an addendum to this work where we particularly look at praise and people um, and how we can um, satisfy the requirements of people who for the last two years have got used to not driving 40 miles up the A30 on a daily basis and um, the impact that's had on our climate sustainability because our, our carbon footprint must have reduced enormously over the last two years but we also need to be able to have fit for purpose office accommodation so that our people can get in to have meetings to use printers um, and for us to differentiate between working from home rather than home workers so um I'd, I'd like um the board to consider the um the uh, development of the hq at bodmin and um, as moving into new county hall um, and to um, retain carlion house but for me to come back to you probably i don't know whether we'll have it done by the 14th of july if not the 14th of july by september um to advise you as to the recommendation for where we think our um uh, additional offices should be to allow cross county access. Any questions? Rachel. Um, a comment which is, I think it's fantastic. I mean, this is a brilliant move to integrate working, develop those relationships, the corridor conversations, the seeing how the democracy works, um, in, in particular in New County Hall. I think my, my query when I was reading the paper was uh, how many actual staff do you have? And you talked about how many that you want that 130 desks, but on what basis have you made the decision that you need 130? based on you know, the proportion of people who are working from home. I, I really support your, your, your ambition to be uh, reducing miles, mileage, um, and the carbon reduction as a result. I think if people are home, I think we wouldn't need that many. So we have um, around 267 staff, um, uh, difference between whole time equivalents and um, uh, numbers of people. Um, we have had we have operated entirely virtually and we have an agile working policy but it is clear that people are wa wanting to come back into office-based accommodation um so the 130 that is in the paper remember may flex if praise and beeble comes back onto um the uh the, the desk numbers for the organization and that's what we really need to test um some of our people really want to work from home we need to test whether for business um, delivery purposes that is going to work for all of our staff. Um, and then also there'll be ongoing employer liabilities around people working from their own homes rather than working in them sometimes. So we'll be able to bring a, a, a more fulsome answer back in September. Neil? Yeah. Um, the, whilst very mindful of the financial imperatives involved with this, um, when I looked at it, I, 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 I naturally, with my ICA hat on, asked the West ICA how they felt about the move. Um, they, they, they are understanding of the reasons. Uh, but in terms of a base in the West of the county that hopefully promotes and engenders the kind of collaborative working that's needed to transform care at place, the ICA are hopeful that there will be support from the ICB to seek solutions which might be across partner organisations to try and find somewhere that provides the kind of face-to-face -face creative type of working which we saw in the last two days. And I think part of that is the distinction between core ICB staff and the development of ICA based teams. So um, the east um, part of North and East ICA would like to retain um, Salt Ash. Has it got an, an, another name of the Which house? Peninsula House in Salt Ash. Now that's an NHS E and I building. So um, we are we are working with them around how much of the empty building we can use for um, East ICA. So I think there are two distinctions here. One's how we bring ourselves together as an ICB, which will get smaller over time because some of our people will go into ICAs and into providers. So as we work over the next couple of years, the planning functions for uh, planning mainstream um, trust-based services probably shouldn't sit with a, the ICA, ICB centrally. So this will change over the next two years. What I'd like to get right from the start is somewhere where we can pull together 200 people in a space and to have a face-to-face a -face conversation because I think a lot of our people have missed that. Um, and for those of you who know the um, 
history of organisational change in Cornwall, whether it's PCGs to PCT small, PCT small to PCT large, PCT large to CCG, you'll know that every single one of those organisational changes has been fraught with concern, conflict, um, sadness. Um, so we're trying really hard to make sure that this one isn't. So um, I'm really happy to bring back iterations right from today i'd like people to know we have a headquarters if you want to talk to somebody you know where to find us we will be present in these parts of the site on these dates so that we've got a visibility across our staff group okay yes i don't think we want to take the elon musk approach to working from home as you know that um but i i, I would also do you know his story he wrote out to us so you can you can work from home so long as you do 40 hours at, in your office first um, which is an interesting approach to remote working. Um, the only thing I would say, uh, which you might want to reflect on, uh, Kate, is I'm not sure we could have done yesterday and the day before on Teams. There is no substitute for that kind of creative, innovative, getting those juices flowing kind of thing that we've got to think about how we engender that and that's done in, in place. Okay, so are we happy to move to the rec recognizing it's changing based on what's Kate said? Are you happy to move? No other comments? So, okay, just help me as I go through these. So, you want us to endorse the proposal from the Council for Accommodation at New County Hall? Yeah. I do, yes, please. And okay. and that Chai Travail is our headquarters. And and that's the second one with the yeah. Chai Travail bond. So, the first two, everyone's happy to recommend? No dissenters? Lovely, thank you. Can we just do the third one? Serve notice on Durham, the house. So, I think we, should, we need to serve notice on Victoria. <laughs> approach in Roach, which is where we are now, but yeah. we shouldn't serve notice on Durham Over House until we've gone back to talk to our people. That's great, yes. Everybody happy with that? Can we... Oh, who's taking the minutes? Yeah, Sam, thank you for taking it. Yes, if you could take that minute, please. Um, and the fourth one? Through the recommendation of a continuation of reciprocal arrangements of accommodation with NHSE yeah. England, um, and that is the Saltash um, Peninsula House particularly. And you want to, you want to we want that. to we want to retain that, and I would like yeah. NHS England to give us a tenure through which we can start moving more people into what is an empty building. Okay, so there's two points there: the minimum, and then going further. Are yeah. you happy to support both of those? You've got both Thank support you. on that. Lovely. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's move on. So we move to approval of the essential ICB governance documents. Now, who's being tested on this? Carolyn. Who's, who's Carolyn, you're going to lead on. <laughs> delegation, and then Simon's going to pick up the uh, the standing financial instructions. So um, we've got our scheme of reservation and uh, delegation, um, and obviously this is outlining our decisions um, and our functions, and and who can actually make a. Yep. I notice that Trudy's not in the room. Is it important that we get any Brown Jacobs feedback first to your observations or not? That's what you're going to cover off. Thank you. Sorry, interrupted. That's okay. Um, and uh, we've had to do this as part of our due diligence and, and as part of the transition piece um, from the CCG to the uh, ICB. But it's also um, part of the governance review that we've started to do. Um, so as in uh, the, the paper, we've got three gov key governance documents which are being presented to the board today. Um, we've got some recommendations there, but what I'd like to point out is this is one of the documents, as I say, that have gone to Brown Jacobson. Um, so this is the solicitor that is actually doing a, a bit of a review for some of our documents at the moment. We've sent them 20 um, and we've had some feedback from nine of them. Um, and effectively, the overall feedback from Brown Jacobson on our scheme of reservation and delegation um, was that uh, it was very, the feedback received in general was positive. On the scheme of reservation and delegation, they suggested that there's um, some helpful inclusion of some missing section numbers, which we will do. Um, they wanted just a little bit of better consistency of language. Um, around the terms of non-executive members in line with the constitution, which we, we're doing. Supplementing some existing clauses with some additional text, um, but there was only three of those. Um, 
inclusion of climate change duties because although we've referred to it they're again they're like a bit of expansion um, and then the final one was inclusion of a further information governance clause regarding appropriate safekeeping and confidentiality of records which will be resigned to the audit committee so um, those things are are now going to be put into place but as I say on the whole they were actually really positive about the scheme of reservation and, and delegation and as I say this also has been to NHSC and I so the board is actually asked to receive the verbal feedback and the comments from Brown Jacobson um, and to approve the scheme of reservation and delegation with the amendments as recommended by Brown Jacobson. They are in the pack, so I'm hoping that people have taken the time to so, look. Yeah, so what that, exactly. So what we'll do is we won't, we won't decide anything yet. We'll get through the whole set of papers and then we'll come back to each one if that's all right. So are there any questions on the... I hate acronyms, I'm never going to try and use them. The Scheme of Reservation and Delegation. No? Okay, Karen, thank you very much. We'll come back to that in a second then. So we'll move on to the Standing Financial Instructions, please, Simon. Thank you. Yes, these uh, these have to be also be to NHS EI, and they've reviewed these as part of our process over the last few weeks. Uh, we've also done a brief comparison exercise with two other ICBs, but having said that, there's still an opportunity because everyone's been working at quite a timeline to produce these to compare more widely. So, but for now, we've had approval from NHSEI. We're we're happy with the content of the SFIs and standing orders as they stand. So I'm um, happy to take questions at this stage, but would just say in a month's time, I'll have a view of the comparison with other ICBs or all seven within the Southwest. And if there's any refinement that comes out of that, that we want to consider, I'll bring that back to a future meeting and just agree how we might do that for, for future purposes. I know Steve, you picked up a question with me yesterday. I don't know whether it'd be useful if you raise the question because it's a helpful one and then I'll, I'll play back a, a view on that. Yeah, thank you. So uh, firstly, I think the SFIs are, are thorough. So um, it's great to see the, the detail in there. The question I had was, in, in most instances, there is an amount reserved uh, as a financial amount at a board level for decision, uh, except for the purchase of healthcare. So in the purchase of healthcare SFI section, I think it's page 29 and 30 of 37, the, um, uh, the delegation is that the finance committee of the board uh, has authorization to approve any amount over five million pounds for purchase of health care uh, with no amount reserved for the board and, and just noting simon that in most other areas there is an amount over which is reserved for a board level decision it's be helpful to understand why that particular category uh, has um, has no reservation at a board level no, happy to it's a good question we went through a journey on this and the logic as it stands i ran this by and two other icbs that i talked to have done the same thing is that the if you if you go back to the business case authorization limits they they include the icb needs to sign off business cases over 10 million which is one percent of our allocation so that's the precursor to a process that would then procure whatever service we were looking at in terms of healthcare. so um it, it's considered that through that route actually the ICB as a board has signed off a ability to buy changes in healthcare and that, that sort of sets the limitation for it and as you can see every limit within the business case part everything over 1 million has to be reported to the ICB as well so there's sort of clear stream so that that's the logic but it, it's the... That's really helpful. If I could just ask a brief follow-up question, and Simon, that, that, that's really, really useful. Just for the, the ICB board assurance then, can I just test that there aren't any circumstances or situations where the, the, the purchase of healthcare above £5 million could be exercised without a business case? Just to check what that kind of mechanism is, because I think what you said is, is really helpful, uh, but is there any any mechanism where that purchase could happen in the absence of a business case? I don't believe so. Not in the discussions of how we call it. We sort of work through the process. And um, I, I guess, that, and for me now to provide the assurance that that is the case, I'm happy to admit that as well. 
Thank That's you. really helpful. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? So for all of our um, formal establishment documents, they all have to be signed off by NHS INA. Um, but as part of briefing us about it, I was told that individual words in the expressed in the wrong way in sentences could be a problem for us over time. So we are having all of them legally reviewed so that we have a minimum sign off by NHS INE and then a legal view around the application of them for us as a, um, a legal entity. So we're trying to make sure that we cover all bases. Question. Any other questions? Okay, so I've got an observation, if I may. So, love the facts. Can I have a, a, a good faith clause that we might have in here, which I'm, I'm, I never think this will happen, but I'm going to say it. Um, if there is a million pounds limit, can we just make sure in good faith that if there's suddenly five millions floating around, we don't end up with five nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine ones <laughs> that don't come to us can, can we just collectively buy into the good faith clause yeah you know what we've all been chief execs on us have so <laughs> play that game myself all right so <laughs> <laughs> damn <laughs> right, right. happy with that very happy yeah. very happy with yeah. the good faith clause I, very my, good my services in the past have been bought on that basis <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't put that in the news <laughs> thank you very, very good Anything else you want to add before we move on? No? no okay, good, thank, thank you. you. So let's move to your... Did you cover off the scheme of delegation in that? Yes. So you covered off both your... Yeah, and that was the query, actually. Was the scheme you you of did the two. So I'm going to pause for a second. On all of those items, anything else anybody else wants to ask or challenge? So before I bring us to the recommendation, anything else you'd like to add, Kate, on that? No. no? Very good. So I'm going to bring us to the recommendations. So we're going to receive verbal, we've received verbal feedback from comments from Brown Jacobson and we're happy to note and take those. Agreed? Yep. We're going to approve the SORT SFI SOD subject to any amendments. Yes. Happy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to delegate responsibility to the Chief Exec to make any minor changes and publish the final versions. Are we happy with that? Yep. Thank you. Um, and receive for approval further copies where substantial changes are required. Yeah, go for it. Sorry, I suppose minor means typos and wording and significant or the mix with changes to pound of value. Just to make the difference between minor and... Yeah. Trudy would like to make an observation? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, Margaret, I think that's my expectation. There's kind of some wordsmithing and things like that. But I, I think what we've found, I'm sorry, I missed the SWORD discussion, but I don't think there was any major changes requested in the SWORD, the schema delegation or the SFI. So I think we're considering all of these as minor changes, which is number three, and we're agreeing that Kate can sign them off. And if anybody wants to see them, we can kind of, we can share the desk. I don't think there's any under four. Any way we can keep it on? Save me, keep missing it, no? Okay. So the good faith clause is basically going to be, you'll see whatever's decided anyway, but in good faith it's meant to be minor, not not, not significant. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that, that's a fair challenge, Margaret. Just for clarity. Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's really important. Okay, done. That's that section done, colleagues. Now, we have rattled through this. Now, what a team are we, eh? Half an hour in advance in a board meeting. Crikey. It'll never, It'll never happen again. It'll never happen again. Okay. Enjoy so, the day. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the day. Can I hear you saying, bring on the more dry subjects? That's what we want. <laughs> okay. Okay, so with your support, I'm going to press on until half past. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to item 11, which is approval of the ICB committee. So I'm going to hand over now to the chairs. So if I can just go to each chair, please don't go in. As the mindset is don't present, but if there's anything that you would like to share that is as part of a new committee, because some people will be used to some of the committees that we're doing, but some of these will be new and different committees, it might be worthwhile just sharing some of your expectations in that, and then for us to ask any questions of you. So I'm just going to go in the order in which I can see colleagues, if I, if I may. So Neil, can I start with you, if I may? In terms of the Primary Care Commissioning Committee, I think um, 
I, I just wanted to um, say that, that those terms of reference have been recently reviewed whilst within the CCG, but in terms of the way the ICB will be working, we added in a paragraph which is below the listed responsibilities on page 7 as to assurance about the role of primary care in supporting system priorities for the ICB and vice versa. It didn't seem right, though much of primary care commissioning is delegated via NHSE, um, that, that primary care wasn't formally acknowledged to be contributing to system priorities, although they do that as part of ICAs. But, but the work in primary care seem to need to link into that. So that's a subtle change that's been added. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Committee, individually, and then I'm going to come back to that overarching one. I thought we might start in the detail here, weirdly for me. But So on this particular committee, any questions or clarification you want from Neil? Rachel? just to make the link just so that everybody's aware that this is um, obviously in tandem with the paper we'll have later about the full primary care delegation agreement so that delegation agreement works in tandem with what the committee then has responsibility for and how it executes that duty very good good thank you move on to your other one please oh i missed yes sorry i just wanted to make a comment about um primary care commissioning as well that you know really the ambition to join up commissioning of primary care from other routes because you know council has responsibility for some of that as well and we did some good work in the uh, ov and scrutiny committee jointly presenting so the opportunity of working differently would include those other um, elements of health through through other parts of the non icb responsibility okay Thanks. So, Neil, can I just use yours before we move on to the second one, actually, just to, to make a general observation. Um, as a group of non-execs, we've had the luxury of actually having quite a few months now, I think, to work together and, and talk about this. And I think we're actually ahead of quite a few of the other 41 ICBs across the country on this. Um, it's much easier, isn't it, to actually start with a smaller group of members um, and then include people in, rather than actually go for, let's invite everyone and go, oh, I wish I actually hadn't done that, and then would you mind leaving the room? Uh, so, so part of the thing here is about to learn and change as we go. And one of the things that we need to do as we move on from, from Neil's committee to some of the others is that we need to work with all partner organisations and their committees just to make sure we understand that we're not doing their piece of work and we're not, there's an element of trust, etc. but we have to gain assurance as well. So at some point, coming back to Rachel's point about a review, there's going to be at some point we're going to need to get to a point where we review not just our terms of reference for this, of committees, but actually our partner organisations and to make sure they are complementary and not competing and that both get assurance from each other and we work as one team. But it doesn't just apply to one committee, that's to all of them. I just, in case I forget that, I wanted to say that now. So please move on to your second one now. Okay. Can I just go back oh, yep. to the PCCC? I forgot to mention that um, because of the issue of conflicts of interest previously, whereby CCG um, met members were GP actively working as GPs and were on the primary care committee. Um, there was a need to hold parts of that meeting in public. However, those issues do not now exist. And I, I hasten to add, I am re fully retired from general practice now. Um, the, therefore, any, any issues that might need to come to public scrutiny would come to the part one of the IC board now. It's a, it's a, that's again a, a small change that's been made. Thanks. The, the ICA committee, this is a new committee um, and effectively the terms of reference, the first one, first main um, substantial bit of it mentions a word development because there is a need to develop against what already exists in the ICAs. That committee will, will be basically providing assurance against the ways that the ICA forums, which will exist in all three parts of the county, deliver against um, the needs and the uh, health inequalities uh, of their populations. Um, and these are all mentioned in the terms of reference, if you've looked at them. And we have been careful to ensure that what we're trying to iterate 
is a developmental process that brings our partner forums along with us in developing a lot of the ways we're going to work. I think it's really important if we're talking about subsidiarity that that is able to happen in that their involvement helps us the way we're going to work. However, it will be necessary to have some assurance which I would call an equity lens and therefore that is why we've asked for partner input with regard to uh, public health which I think is essential in that committee although there will be partners in all of the ICA forums um, and <clears throat> we also feel that it would be helpful to have membership from the v VSF and from partner organisations RCHT and CFT. We haven't determined that yet, we haven't asked for it, we're still in a process of forming and our first meeting may not include all partners but we'll be working towards how we achieve that base in, in the hope that it provides a level of scrutiny on the work that we're going to do in integrated care areas. Thank you. Any questions? On... Yes, please. Yeah. So I think in the way you've described it now, this is a de minimis starting point in terms of um, how we have oversight, governance and development of our of our integrated care areas. I suspect this will be one of the, um, the terms of reference which will evolve over time as we need a controls assurance framework for both quality and financial accounting as money goes out of um, the ICB into the ICA. So I welcome the fact there's flexibility in there for us to be able to build that over time. Any other questions before we move on? I've got one observation just to make. This is me trying to be helpful. So we all start with similar kind of ideas. So given the fact that we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier on, that the three managing directors who are, I have to say again, I don't like the, I don't like the title. Okay, I'll just throw it out there. Don't like the title because it infers everyone reports into them. But it's a mechanism, I think, for us. Once we agree as a collective group that we actually wish to take certain commissioning and pass down to place level, the importance then is that the committee that you then chair will make sure that it's scrutinised and also, because the idea is it's not just a scrutiny committee in terms of um, once the decision has been taken we'll just tick the box, there's a, there's a, we've got to add value as a group and add challenge uh, on its way to making decisions too. So there's something for me about an up and down process here, but I think it's really important then that, that colleagues at place level feel they can contribute, but once it's then decided in terms of the money, on behalf of the of the statutory group around this table that actually your group are scrutinizing that just so you're really happy with that Rachel and, and clear on that yeah very good okay so Carol please introduce your two committees so that the first one can everyone hear me I know these mics are a bit you're not hearing yeah, it's more for the mic is more for Debbie actually the lady over there was um, yeah, anyway, so yes, so the first one is uh, quality and uh, pathways of care and, and interestingly looking and talking to some other ICBs, uh, they aren't necessarily described in this way, this, this particular committee. So in other committees is quality and uh, commissioning or performance is, was also included. We'll, we'll come on to us, there's a separate um, reason why that's been separated. So we've got, we've got two um, two pieces of content here. We've got the quality side and the pathways of care. Um, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I'll be honest straight up, you know, the, the quality side of it, I'm getting my head around national guidance, but clearly from my point of view, I'll be looking at what does quality mean locally. And I mean, clearly, uh, Helen and Susan, uh, my two go-tos have only just come on board. So we'll be spending some time together about what that means. So I, I really want to understand what the national requirement is but also then what do we want to be doing locally uh, the pathways of care bit for me is is around the the journey of the person in Cornwall of the Isles of City through the system and that for me is really exciting I, I'm really that's the bit I really want to get my head around about how can we improve that journey and what's people's experiences now and how good can it be um, and that's really, and, and then it talks about, you know, tackling inequalities and we've obviously got the planning and the improvement side of it and it's got some governance and risk in there as well. So. I'm getting tired of myself, let alone, I apologise. Yes, right. right, so, um, any particular questions 
on this one. Yeah. Thank you, Kat. Really interesting what you're saying about the pathways journey. And I think this is a really important committee being on the CCG governing body for a number of years. You know, this is, um, to me, you know, crucial business. And I'm interested that uh, what is the difference between how we were doing things in a CCG and this quality committee? That That's, I guess, my question um, in this sort of new stage. And we're talking about more integration. Um, the pathway journeys you won't see entirely because we're not looking at quality data for non health sector so i'm just questioning the purpose of sort of you know the broadening of and, and sort of trying to be more integrated how are we going to do this through these committees that is different because you haven't got i don't think you've got sort of safeguarding input from the council i don't i mean there are links obviously through the safeguarding boards but um you know with, there's particular roles around eppr that the council lead that it's all sort of into i just want to see a bit more like let's do things a bit different and i, I just i mean maybe that's sort of start of the journey and, and we can think about that but if we keep just we can't look at the pathway if we're just missing out chunks of the system in the discussions this might be i i hope to give you some reassurance and i think that you know john's appointment of the board members is precisely that so I, I was 12 years at Cornwall Council, so I understand all the other aspects that can be brought to this committee. So I, I liked your question and I'll be using that as my first question. So what's going to be different? Because it, it's not about doing things as we did them before. Don't have the answers now, but I want you to challenge me in the future if I don't bring those answers. Yeah. Okay. I can make that. Mary. Thank you. Just to say you didn't mention within your consultees uh, the independent care sector and pathways of care are very significant for us and also something that CQC are now actively going to be reviewing. So I just sort of flag that. So one of the things that I want to have different around how we look at quality is what we're buying, who gets it and the so what of the impact because that is very much around the quality of the care that we buy. So, um, and we'll still be buying care as a strategic commissioner. It's just we'll have different outcomes that we'll measure ourselves against over time. And um, I think there is something about how the committee sets itself up and its work program, because there will be the general flow of, you know, the constitutional stuff that we have to measure as a buyer of healthcare. But there should also be deep dives on the parts of our system where we know we've got the greatest issues and they could be you know thematic reviews that we commission through our quality and pathways group so how we do things i think is as important as the terms of reference that underpin them um, and i'm really happy to to work with you carol in terms of how we set that up with susan and with helen so part of the reason why i wanted some oh Margaret, yeah i just wondered since the quality will be obviously heavily determined by the people providing the care, what connection you envision doesn't necessarily need to be in the terms of Russian. It's just trying to understand what connection you are thinking about with the providers. I don't have, a, I don't have an answer on that one, so can you? No, I think having, having the role set up, Margaret, here, I mean, I'm obviously getting becoming familiar so having steve representing providers but i'm aware as mary's pointed out that that's a section of, of nhs providers and also debbie representing mental health it's how we pull all of those thinking those minds into place to help as kate says start to get that work plan that's totally inclusive and then it's 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 going to have to be a dynamic process because there will be no doubt areas that we haven't thought of that we need to pull in but it's it's an it's a really exciting time to bring all of those people together. Yeah. But using Steve, using Debbie in the nicest possible way when I say use, um, plus all of our, our voluntary sector um, and and care providers. Can I make a uh, suggestion? Can I just, can, uh, it's probably. I think I'm on. Um, it, it, it's just we we have quality committees, and I'm just thinking at linking, some sort of linking at that level. Um, to, to help inform thinking might be useful, rather than, whether it's official or unofficial, just sort of some linking to help get the thinking going might be useful in the early days. I completely agree, Margaret. So my helpful suggestion was going to be there are some things that are statutory accountabilities of the ICB that we have to have reported through um, our quality committee. There's the relationships through the 
the quality assurance committees that we already go to i think the flow of information through those isn't as robust as it could be and then there's a developmental agenda around how we are going to look like we did over the last couple of days across the collection of services that we've got in cornwall um, and then how we focus on individual parts of of the county and individual services so um i think if we could set up our agenda statutory sharing and developmental then it would allow us to get into all of those spaces okay i agree and what i was trying to do was also minimize duplication of reporting John, so, so Margaret. sorry could i just finish just finally on that margaret just to reassure you what we don't want to do i don't think any of these committees and i speak for my member colleagues is duplicate what's going on at day-to-day -day activities when we say we want to keep these short and snappy and that's my, my language it's not about whizzing it through but it's actually about scrutinizing what's important and understanding and getting assurance from people saying is that activity happening give show me the insurance is it happening show me the proof okay let's move on let's do something else otherwise we're just layering and layering and layering and actually there's, there's no script no Steve? absolutely agree thank you Steve? so i was going to leave this to the, the the overall position i do have some uh, questions around the the proposed scrutiny arrangements that will be rep, uh, applicable to all committees relevant to the points that have just been made but but there do you want me to cover them now john or when we get to the overall position okay yes yes could you go? yeah as i said at the start of this little section um we can't move to a position where we're doing what the providers are doing and do it here as well what a waste of time and not trusting each other okay. however think about it the executive group have only just really turned up so we've been a non-exec group in a bubble trying to work out who should be and what not should be the one observation i would make on this particular committee is there is an element of the statutory role which we're going to have to do when it comes to quality and we're just going to have to do it but in imagine an hour i'm not trying to be rude about it but if we can just keep maybe 10 minutes to the statutory bit and make sure all the providers don't need to do one of the ideas the big ideas behind this committee was to actually talk about end-to-end -end pathways across all organizations and open up mary to to your team and and your colleagues and into the council and that and actually ask the question when we talk system actually we just mean two nhs providers or do we actually mean from a person center all the touch points that they've actually got and that's where we don't know where we're going to go with that yet and i think that's the trouble we don't know where we're going okay so please at, go for it yeah we ought to have to keep it real in terms of the expectation by NHS INE around the regulatory functions that are still attached to us as a as a commissioner of healthcare. Um, and one of the things that I'm hoping will improve having all of us around the table with that shared responsibility is that we um um we are I'm not saying we haven't been open, but we are very, very open around the issues, the problems, the impacts, so that as a collective um, there isn't anything that RCHT and CFT or UHP or the ambulance service can do on their own because we are risk linked across everything that we do. So, so I think this quality committee could be a great place for us being really clear about what our problems are and for having gen genuine joint assurance that we're pushing and prodding in the right ways to sort them out. That's so that's, that's what I'd like it to yeah, be. Fine. Okay. I'm quite keen to move on, colleagues, to get to the overarching bit. So second committee, please. Quick, oh, very quickly, John. So the second committee is citizen engagement and equalities, and I'd almost like to change out the word engagement and call it influence. So this, this for me is about true influence of the person, the people in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, um, and it's the influence on the improvement, the change, and the satisfaction levels of people. And how do we do that? Um, all my career has been based around this very subject it's very difficult there's no one answer um, and it's going to be an exciting journey but it must be at the heart of everything we do and another good example where we don't have the answer yet so mary uh, thank you um i agree agree with those points 100 uh, percent um just there are um, nine meetings of the committee scheduled for each year i just wonder when you were planning to kick kick off that when the first one would be 
as we've just got colleagues on board, we need to decide. I know some some dates have already started going in the diary, but it's about whether we've got anything meaningful yet to discuss. So we do need to get that sorted. And I would imagine in the next two weeks, once we've met with the exec team, we'll get those dates out. Yeah, the IMO generally is non-execs to meet with their lead execs and to agree by committee what works and what's relevant on, on that. So got a bit, a bit of a journey to go. OK, thank you, Carol. So let's move to Sanj. Great. Um, I think the terms of reference speak for themselves, but I think the three key pillars obviously are going to be finance, performance and commissioning. On finance, first of all, I think it's important to say, um, actually, uh, as with performance, we're looking at both oversight of the ICB itself, but also the ICB footprint. And so one of the challenges will be trying to do more in the same amount of time in terms of that meeting. So it's going to have to be quite efficient. And it echoes the point John and Carol have made about not duplicating what providers are doing. We simply don't have that kind of time, um, not when we're also looking after the ICB itself. Um, I think it's really important to say that um, in how we do it, we're looking at really active financial spending and tracking as well as forecasting how we're going to do so we don't get to month 11 and get surprised by anything and also that um, the ICB itself should not escape scrutiny from this committee so we are really uh, on a level playing field as a committee. Uh, on performance just to say I think um, that is an area that is arguably underdeveloped and, and something that I'm really focusing on and the committee will too, both in terms of tracking um, how we do things from a quality perspective, working with Carol, but also from an inequalities perspective, which is really important to all of us as non-executive members and something we've talked about at length. Um, and so um, that's something that will become a bigger part of the agenda than I think it has been in the past. Uh, and lastly, on commissioning, um, to say that, you know, I think the... ICB operating plan is our, our guiding star, but I think equally we want to be a committee that can advise on how things change in year with advice and support from partners both around the table, uh, but also not around this table at the moment. Um, just to say on membership, um, we just would like to keep things relatively small to begin with and then expand as needed. So please do follow up if you have questions or queries on the membership list, but certainly Rachel O'Connor as Director of Inclusion and the CFO Simon will be um, standing members and of course Kate is welcome to attend any or all meetings. Um, when it comes to partners, really would like to have a conversation on what makes sense and when you'd like to be involved and certainly a lot of transparency in how we feed up the outcomes, not minutes that don't always get read, but the key outcomes uh, at this meeting so that they're sequenced. So you will hear outputs and outcomes from that committee at the ICB. OK, thank you. Martin? Thanks, John. Yes, the audit committee is sort of mandated nationally. And as such, most of the terms of reference are you know, aligned to a national set of terms of reference, which we were provided with. Um, probably the only thing I would mention is uh, amendment to that was that we've also undertaken to be what we call the auditor panel for the organization which means that we will um, take on the role of recruiting our external auditors um, as i understand it our existing external auditors grant thornton are going to carry on for this financial year so we've got a, a set of accounts for the last financial year just being finished off now we'll also have a second set of accounts um, for the last three months of the CCG and then the first year of the ICB accounts will be audited by Grant Thornton but we will have to appoint a new auditor so we'll be undertaking that process I imagine some and some time uh, towards the end of this calendar year. Um, so yes many of the standard things financial reporting, risk, uh, internal and external audit, governance internal controls, um, counter fraud and, and whistleblower. Very good. Okay let's let's start with workforce. Um, Let's not be under any illusions how huge a, an issue our workforce is across across all partners and providers. Um, so we really need a really collaborative approach on this. And I think it's got a great opportunity to, to show how having an integrated system can really make a big difference, Mary, from the people that you're working with in the independent providers from the voluntary sector all the way through all of the different providers. Um, so we need to be able to move from the crisis that we're currently in to a joined up strategy with some jointly agreed priorities and some collective and agreed interventions and we need a whole workforce um, whole system workforce that 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 looks at people and and, and then being part of our workforce being part of a caring system um, 
that needs to be much more organisationally agnostic while meeting the needs of each of the partners and, 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 and de deliverers on their own. We know it's not just about workforce and their qualifications, it's about their, their terms of conditions, it's about the cost of living crisis that's going to be coming upon us, and, it, and it's about their housing and transport as well. Um, as I said, it's a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity. So um, we've started quite small in terms of the, the, the regular members and will then move and widen out and, and allow more people to come in in terms of good practice work and, and getting some traction. I'm not going to say anything more about workforce. So, so Remcom, um, I, I stand between you and a cup of tea. So um, the, the, the first part of it is it's remuneration committee yeah okay so so firstly i think there's no real issue about the first remcom but i i believe kate there's a minor issue about the remcom review group um do you want to deal with that now yeah very happy to so very supportive of the remcon uh terms of reference itself the um appendix one uh, provides the details of the non-executive member remuneration review group and i know we've all read that <laughs> Uh, that proposes a membership of two ICB executive members of the board, two ICB partner members and an independent member. Uh, I would just observe that um, uh, c clearly non-executive directors of this board have a role to determine the salary of the executive directors like of this board. Uh, so I would suggest we, yeah, yeah. we amend that. Yeah. Tom, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I think well, I think Kate's going to take some takes. Yeah. Well, take some. So I've asked, I asked Trudy to speak to our solicitors to get some advice before our meeting today. Um, they discuss they have they have advised us that um, two ICB members, John and myself, so myself still makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, two ICB partner members and two other non-ICB people who are part of the ICB board with a quorum of four. Um, the above has the benefit that two and three, so ICB partner members and two non-ICB people who are part of the ICB board outweigh the fact that I'm there as the chief exec. Um, I've asked for the um, advice in writing so we can circulate with our um, colleagues. I'd like to go back and I think it's, I, I'm not sure it's right that I'm on the, um, uh, the review group for our non-executive colleagues. So we are going to benchmark this, this, this with other organisations in setup. For the AHSN, I'm on their review a group for non-executive directors, but I'm there as a non-renumerated non-executive director. So we will um, benchmark best practice um, and we'll send a post-meeting minute out of the membership of this group so that everybody's aware if that's OK. And, and you need to sign up. Yep. Is that OK, Tom? Yep. What, what, whatever you do. But well made. That, that's really helpful. Thank you. All right, Trudy, go for it. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask the question that we were hoping to meet um, over lunchtime in order to agree the NEMS current remuneration levels that were agreed by the CCG when they were appointed in in February. Would it be OK to actually work on the basis that the kind of the proposal that uh, Brown Jacobson have sent us and if we were going to kind of not That's have you one. kind of being part of the course yeah. anyway, Kate, for that remuneration, that we can still go ahead with that? today would board members be happy with that or do you want me to kind of defer that decision that was supposed to be happening this afternoon can I just ask what the implication is if we don't meet does anything happen to our um terms and conditions for people already appointed from the ccg can we roll that forward whilst we get robust advice that as a board we're happy with so we have to i think payroll will close down something like the ninth of the month so potentially nems won't be paid so can I, can I make a recommendation that we roll forward the CCG Remcom's recommendation for a further month whilst we get legal advice that everybody's happy with? Does anybody um, object to that? Do you object to that? Oh, so long as it's OK and work. Does it work from a yeah. statutory perspective? Okay. We're not breaking rules. Colleagues? Um, and we'll then that? end up having a, a virtual meeting. Um, and just so people are aware, there were no, as part of that, uh, 
review panel meeting this afternoon there was no increase or anything it was literally just a like for like so rem remcom's a place where we get into trouble so remcom needs to be managed well yeah. so if there is any disquiet around how we're establishing the pay review group for our non-executive yeah. members my strong advice to the board is that we take the recommendation and i had as the ao from the ccg i'm the, I'm the continuity me and simon actually done, done um done. and that we review within a month and come back with um legal advice we're all happy with yeah, if I could, I just challenge, is there any reason why it couldn't be done on the 14th? None at all. Why don't we try and get to that? Yeah. yeah. Done. Lovely. So let's move on. So that's all the committee. So let's just come back to the overarching stuff. I've left it to the end because I wanted to have some, get you to get some feel about how each committee might, what's there for, how it might work, the gaps it's going to evolve and that kind of thing. So. Uh, to be fair, the, the new non-exec group uh, and myself spent quite a lot of time actually trying to work on these and coalesce behind something that you could almost sort of say it is the thing that each of these committees needs to hold a litmus test to uh, in terms of that, uh, for which I was very grateful for, for Kate reviewing it and being happy with it at a point. So is there any observations that you want to make on that? If not, we'll take that. Yeah. So just to text you on then, this is about the overall yeah. setup. Uh, so I did have a, a question, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and it, it builds on some of the comments that have been made about not duplicating with uh, existing work. Yeah. Uh, the current um, expectation that's set out in the papers is that every ICB committee, so all eight of them, uh, will seek assurance from the delivery partner's own scrutiny committees in a timely fashion. Yeah. Uh, and the paper sets out a number of specific things that the, each each of the eight committees will do, uh, ensuring action plans, budgets and agreed key performance indicators are on track and yeah. mitigation actions are agreed. Uh, I'm sure that would be appropriate in some instances. I can think of the, the finance uh, and performance aspects and the quality and safety aspects, but, but if we pick Remcon as an example, and, and there'll be other examples, it, it, it may not be appropriate for the ICB uh, committees to, to formally seek uh, th that level of action plan, uh, insurance uh, and performance um, progress. Uh, so from a governance perspective, I have some concerns about that being set out as in, well, in the Remcon example, it, it could be, but I, I use Remcon only as an example. There may be other uh, committee actions in the provider organisations, which uh, it, it just may not be appropriate to, to share in that detail with ICB committees. So I have a governance question. Uh, and also, separately, there's a, a pragmatic question about the ability of the uh, eight ICB committees to to require that level of information from at least four NHS provider sets of committees. Uh, and actually, the way the terms of reference are written, it, it isn't exclusive to the NHS providers. Uh, so there is a, a, a potentially significant amount of work as well uh, associated with that. Uh, and, and I certainly don't raise that, uh, well, well I, I raise that, but not with any intent for that, that we shouldn't be providing this information where it's appropriate. Uh, and I just wonder whether in that particular section, there might be a, a different form of language, which is where, where it's required, or in some instances, uh, relevant ICB committees uh, may or will seek assurance. But at the moment, it's, it's written as, uh, as a requirement that every committee will seek that level of assurance from every committee in the respective uh, provider organisations. Take me to the particular paragraphs or pages that you're, you want to, to tweak, please. So if, what we're not trying to set out to do here is to create an engine that needs feeding, okay? What we're cognizant of is that we have a collective statutory responsibility that we need, if asked, we can actually say we're cited, we're engaged, we're supportive and that kind of thing. So this is my point about in an hour, there's sort of 10 minutes of we've got to do this kind of stuff. And over here, you know, we can we can work out what we want to do. Um, so I'm just trying to sort of tick both, both boxes there, Steve, really, without trying to be, this is, this is trying to write a work of art, isn't it, really, sometimes? So it's in the ICB committees and links with providers uh, section. Oh, the bit at the bottom there, page two. Uh, which starts, each committee will seek assurance from our delivery partners' own scrutiny committees in a timely fashion, and, and then goes on to list a number of, of actions. So for the 
uh, avoidance of uh, of doubt and misunderstanding, John, I, I'm absolutely clear that we shouldn't have any surprises or shocks in the system. Yeah. And, and absolutely providers uh, have a, a key role to play in ensuring that the ICB and its committees are informed of, of issues and, uh, and, and concerns. So I don't have a concern about that. What, what, what I do uh, worry about is the, uh, the, that this is in place across every committee and the, the level of detail that's requested. So could I put a suggestion now that we back this, but as an issue comes up, Steve, that actually each chair is spoken to and actually asked to get collective agreement in that committee as to what the amendments are to that? Because it, if not, we make we, we make it so generic, we, we take the foot off every pedal when it might just be one committee that's got the issue. Would that work? Yeah. So could we could we do this developmentally? Because this is a different way of working, isn't it? So, um, so for example, if a CQC report comes in for a provider, at the moment there's no requirement for the provider to share the CQC report with the commissioner because the sharing is via the region with the CQC rather than to the commissioner. So there are, there are some things that I would like us to change straight away because having sight of concerns, issues, um, areas where we can genuinely support each other and be held collectively accountable for things would be very helpful. So I just wonder, as a developmental part of pulling all of our committees together, could we almost start to discuss what are the things that we would share now that we wouldn't have shared before and build up, a, I don't know, over time, um, a trust that we could share at a much earlier level? Um, and I think we can only do that in each committee with the people around the table um, and working across our providers. So I, I know that's a bit woolly and it's not a, um, a very clearly defined action, but what it relies on is that we have an intention to work together in a different way. Um, and speaking in the, the, the role that I sit on this board uh, as, so, so not from an RCHT perspective, but clearly from a uh, on behalf of our NHS providers, I think that principle of working differently is something we strongly embrace and, and, and that provides really an outstanding opportunity for transforming health and care in, in this region. The, the, the way it's currently phrased though, I think does potentially provide some, well, it, it does place some <coughs> absolute expectations. When I, when I think of the, uh, the, the level of risk which has been managed in each provider, the actions plans that are in place and the the, the 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 additional workload that this would potentially generate for the providers and for the the, the committees that, that that does concern me uh, so, so if there is um, a, an agreement from the board to support the principle of no shocks uh, no surprises uh, early sight escalation uh, of, yep. of issues uh, and, and perhaps a, a request that that I might work with the committee chairs to uh, and with Kate to, to have a form of words that reflects that that, that delivers that that um, commitment, and we could potentially do that before the the fourteenth of of July. Um, for our September board meeting, that gives actually the executive group quite a bit of time to chat to the chairs as well and think it through. Yeah, so if we could minute that as an agenda item for September, Rachel. Just a further over all point chair, I think um, the real beauty in how we look across all of the outputs coming through the committees here is I think how we try and move to that balanced scorecard approach. So we've got individual committees looking at finance, performance, quality, but actually how the totality of that comes together of the board around the read across of the improvements we're making um, to the outcomes um, and the, the um, experiences of our, of our people receiving our, our care. Um, is critical so um, I think that's another area as executives we've talked about is how with our chairs and our partners we look at bring how what comes here as a balanced scorecard approach that, that shows that so it's just to note that that work will be in development also it plays to Steve's point then about that sequencing through through the um, organisation and through to the committees. Lovely thank you so I'd like to move to the recommendations so the recommendations are to approve uh, the overarching um, intentions the terms of reference with the changes steve that, that you've you've asked for and we'll, we'll take that on board um and in fact we'll go further than the first recommendation into the second one on the second one it asks for a review by march what we've just said is we'll, we'll ask for an early early review uh but by september we'll still have a little reflection in march but i think if we have a an early reflection in, in september i'm hoping that works for everyone so can we take that as, as read noted agreed 
Done. Lovely. We're back 100% back on schedule in terms of time, which I absolutely love. Okay, so please take 15 minutes, have a natural break, grab, grab a drink, and let's be back at 5-2, please. Thank you very much. Right, okay, colleagues, so let's crack on. So we're now actually at item 12. So, Carolyn, would you be kind enough to introduce ICB policies, please? Yes, thank you. Um, then this is a section on some, on some key policies. Our constitution documents um, uh, rely on some of these policies, and again, um, these policies are part of the review that Brown Jacobson are doing for us. Um, so there are particular ones for today that we'd like to look at um, is obviously our policy on policies. So our ICB is going to have this policy of policies, um, which is effectively how we develop, approve, distribute, implement, regularly review and um, revise our policies. Um, so again, hopefully people have taken the time to read it. Um, what we've asked Brown Jacobson to do is to review those key policies within the policy of policies um, and the ones that you see on this list are the ones that we've had feedback back so far. What I would say is that um, Brown Jacobson have actually commended us on our policy of policies. Um, again, a couple of small things that they would like us to um, tweak, my words, nobody else's. Um, uh, but on the whole, they've commended this policy as a good policy. So um, if I stop at the policy of policies, John, and do you want to yes. go through them individually? Uh, or just will I go through you them? You go through the whole lot, then that'll probably be okay. a bit faster. Yeah. Okay. So um, second one that uh, I'd like to kind of commend to the board is the standards of the business conduct policy. This is basically our guidance on ethical standards. Um, and again, um, this policy is mandatory for us and referred to frequently within our constitution and the model guidance issued by NHS England. Um, two very small bits of feedback from Brown Jacobson, um, just uh, a few extra words around um, the anti-fraud section, um, and they want to just, just build our definition of colleague. Um, so that was those ones. Our corporate business standards policy is our information for staff um, on key governance areas. Um, and again, um, this is an internally developed policy, um, which obviously for our perspective uh, captures various corporate governance related matters within a single policy. And again, some small bits of feedback from Brown Jacobson, just about including some additional detail that links back to the constitution. Um, so the thing that they kind of said is um, obviously the need to update the board partner nomination process with the revised national guidance. Um, there was a, a few things, um, a few words that had been missed out from there. So that was that procurement framework. Um, there was a fair few comments on the framework. However, it was recognized that um, for colleagues who maybe don't know, the procurement legislation is going to change significantly in September through to um, April 23. So there'll be a new procurement portal and a new way of procuring things. So therefore, we are awaiting the guidance around all of that. So we will need to revisit the procurement framework when that comes out and the, the relevant documentation around it. So the... Um, one of the recommendations, obviously, um, we'll come to is about accepting this policy as is with a complete review of the policy um, later on in the year, once we understand the full guidance around the new procurement portal and the way that um, we are being asked to procure differently in the future. Uh, our conflict of interest policy. Um, so, again, um, this is um, something that... Um, we need to do. Uh, it was a major rewrite of uh, the NHS Kerno policy. Um, Brown Jacobson have uh, suggested um, uh, two new sections covering legal and policy requirements, as well as the principles of managing conflicts of interest. 
um, but again there's some national guidance for that um, and uh, in addition they've also suggested a conflict of interest guardian um, and um, asking that we'll review that that section um, but that needs to be a, a non-executive member so at the moment that that's the feedback that we've had again on the whole good feedback but some minor changes that they would want us to take forward okay so let's try and do this in some sort of structured order um not by exception um I, anybody want to raise anything on the policy of policies Excuse me. So, so I'm not known for being a pedant, really, but in this I, I, I have um, distinct pedantry. So our Policies for Policies is our underpinning framework that allows us to satisfy um, the conditions to defend a judicial review. So the reason why we have to have all of these policies checked, aligned, making sure that they speak to each other and terminology is correct all the way throughout, is this is our legal framework for operating and if we operate within these policies and within this framework we'll be making lawful and legally safe decisions so i think it, it is just worth people being very clear that um the the feedback we're getting from brown jacobson isn't discretionary we will be adopting it um and um as we get the other policies coming online so for example our decommissioning and disinvestment policy and procedure it's important that um, all of this sits together into one suite. So when we've got the one suite, I would quite like to bring all of it back to say, this is the suite that we're working with. Um, and I know the phrase policy for policies makes people roll their eyes because it sounds really bureaucratic, but it's a safety net. Do you have a view on when we, we might see the review of that? Do you know a bit more? Um, so there's another 11 other policies that Brown Jacobson are looking at. I will get feedback by the 12th of July so I can give you a verbal update at the next meeting. And then what we can do is make sure that all those changes are, are kind of incorporated and, and back into September. Lovely. Happy with that? Yes. My other question, though, is that, you know, around the procurement policy, there were quite a few um, comments that Brown Jacobson had. Um, are we safe operating between July and September when the legislation changes? And are there any is there any materiality to the comments that they're making around our procurement practices? So, do you want to... <laughs> Kate, I don't think there is because we're waiting for the legislation that is about to be released in September. However, I can go back and absolutely double check that for clarity. What I don't know is whether we have got any procurements that will happen between now and and September or January when we bring the policy so we can find that out as well. I think undoubtedly we will. I just want to make sure our current practice is safe and lawful. So if there's anything that impacts on us we are today, we need to make immediate um, steps to put it right. It is, uh, we, we will take that on board. And uh, Julie Davis, who's our local expert, has reviewed the current guidance that we've got in place. She has made some comments that we'll bring back to the next meeting, but we are following the national requirements. We're safe at the moment. Yes, I'm asking could, a different could, could we question. Know that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm asking a different question. That's, seriously, okay. that's an important point. Okay. Well. So Brown Jacobson have looked at our current policy okay. and they've made comments on it. What I want to know is are those comments material in terms of how we currently function? Because Julie's of us. So from an external legal yeah. view, yeah. that's just what I'd, for the minutes would be really helpful. Yeah. We do that. Okay, anything anyone wants to raise on this standards of business conduct policy? Steve? It's just a, 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 I think, probably a brief question. My assumption is the this policy applies to ICB employees, not ICB board members. And, and one of the reasons for asking that question is the, uh, the, the media interviews section, as an example, requires that... Um, board members seek approval from the board chair or the chief executive to undertake uh, uh, interviews. Now, clearly, a, a number of colleagues uh, around this table in their mm -hmm. capacity outside of the NHS, uh, IC, sorry, the ICB board, outside of that would be undertaking those things on a, on a routine basis. Uh, so, so there might be other uh, parts of the, the, the various um, uh, policies which have that um, kind of question as well so I think what I'm looking for clarity wise is that this this is uh, applicable to ICB employees rather than ICB board members I 
the stats proof. So, so, I, so I think it's the mode of operating, Steve. So if you're operating in the mode as Chief Exec of RCHT, your accountabilities are back to your board for media interviews or whatever else is in here. If you are operating in the mode as the um, provider voice, the provider partner on the integrated care board, then I think it would need to be an integrated care board discussion. Because I think for anybody who isn't a full-time employee of the ICB, got other day jobs so I think it's the mode of operating that this would cover rather than um, employed or non-employed members I think and just to to add and it, it, it might we might not need this kind of level of, of detail but uh, in to use the media thing as an example it, it's entirely conceivable I'd be asked to do a media interview on Monday about um, uh, ambulance delays, uh, be asked for review as, as RCHT chief executive and, and then quite naturally be asked for some comment uh, around that. So uh, it, 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 the media bit particularly stood out to me uh, and, and even, even in being asked to use that example as the NHS provider attendee member of this board I'd still probably have a, a view that that would be something I, I would do and uh, certainly I would keep colleagues engaged uh, and informed about that it's important that we all manage that together but I suppose I use the media as an example that there might be other aspects where it's, it's not immediately apparent whether these things apply to ICB employees or or ICB board members where they're not employees internal conflict haven't we whether we're little icb big icb so i think developmentally it's something that we might just have to suck and see um and it's part of the developing the linked trusting arrangements between us isn't there so there should be nothing that you say that we don't know already because i'm sure you'll have said it all around the table so um so i i think um i think we might need to reflect on it Thank you for raising it, Steve. I think this affects all four partner members, and I'm just wondering whether there's... Because I, I, can, I can take the point completely that, you know, uh, lots of people have different types of roles. Depends which hat they're wearing. Um, and my personal view would be when you're wearing your hat here, just make that clear, and then you, we've got to collectively stick to our roles, but when you're wearing your other one, just... But we don't want to put you in an invidious position. It's just being clear that you're clear and your other three colleagues when what applies when. Is there anything we can help our four colleagues with on that? I think the distinction that's been described makes, oh, sorry, I oh, say it's on. Uh, the distinction described about capacity in which people are operating makes yeah. eminent sense. Whether that requires changing wording or whether that's one of the things that might be recorded in the minutes as a minute of this discussion to clarify that um, would be the question yeah, for the committee, really. Happy with that? Uh, Neil was next, yeah. On page four, there's a responsibility section, number four, and below it, it says, all colleagues are expected to follow this policy. When I read it, I looked at board committee, subcommittee, and advisory group members, bearing in mind that I will be working with a subcommittee, what's defined as a subcommittee in the structure of ICA forums. And my question was going to be, do we owe an, a responsibility to all colleagues that they know about this policy? And how do we share policies, including things like procurement that might impinge on the way that people begin to work as they emerge into an ICB style of working? So remember, the only statutory officer in an ICA at this point is the managing director, brackets, not sure the title's right. And they're there so that we can use money as a way of getting into ICAs. Um, we know that the way we want them to work is around micro commissioning, which doesn't lend itself to our current procurement processes, but may well do after September. So we might have an interregnum between now and then. 
the reality of us being able to do anything fancy between now and then is quite limited too. I don't think the forums need to be fettered by the policies that underpin the board, but they might want to know about them for information because once we move into um, assurance frameworks with a bit more structure around them, they will be bound by some of our policies. So we might just want to let them know about them. Okay, Carol. Just very quickly going back to Steve's point, I think it's really with my comms hat on, uh, the media inquiries won't see you wearing two hats, they'll ask you anyway. So I think no matter what we write in the policy, it's about going back to John's point, which is you wouldn't be saying anything publicly anyway that you, we're probably not aware of. Um, so it, that's good to be accepted. Yep. So all of these comments obviously will take away and obviously as part of the, the governance review that we're thinking of going through, um, or not thinking we are going to go through, we can obviously go back and revisit some of these, these comments um, and then um, get people's views outside of here as well as the views that are minuted. Okay. Um, I think we've talked about the procurement one, the conflict of interest policy, anything there? No, so let's look at the recommendations then. The board is asked to receive verbal feedback from Brown and Jacobson. We have done that. Uh, subject to any comments, amendments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you feel truly we've captured those? Are you happy with the amendments that we've captured? Yeah. Delegate responsibility to uh, the chief exec for any minor changes on the same principle of minor changes and... Um, we spoke about earlier. Uh, allow the ICB committees, as outlined in the policies and procedures, to approve further amendments to the policies where substantial changes are required. Yep, okay. And approve the adoption of the remaining NHS kernel policies subject to review by March 2023. Rudy. Sorry, just because I was out of the room, it's really <coughs> important that. We have 250 policies at the CCG. We have reviewed about 60 or 70 of them. Yeah. Um, the remaining ones will be reviewed before March 23, hopefully far sooner than that, but we have to adopt yes. the CCG's policies as we move over to the ICB, but they will continue to sit on the CCG website, and when they get updated and reviewed, they'll then be transferred across to the ICB website. If you could make that clear in the minutes, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say? So again, I think we need a timeline. So we've now established the ICB and we'll be moving into determining the operating model, the places of work, the underpinning um, standard operating procedures for us as a board. Those policies in entirety will underpin that piece of work. So I'd, I'd like to see the timeline for the policies being reviewed um, and almost if we chunk them up into the ones that are going to have a, a, an impact on people we employ. Um, and then the other policy. So can I ask for that to be done outside the, the meeting? Yep. Yeah. Can we see the timeline so we yep. set our expectations? If you could minute Thank that, you. I'd be grateful. Thank you. Yes, Rachel? I'm just connected to that. Can we actually risk assess which we do in what order as well and, and have a kind of a yeah. balanced scorecard yeah. approach into our assessment of what those are? Thank you. Okay. Rachel? Thank you. Can I make a general comment about the um, the, the sort of impact assessment element of policies because obviously this is a big sort of process isn't it that the, the current sort of um you know sort of listing of six pillars and, and and some of that i i feel could be a bit more easy and accessible and robust around looking at that because i think in in respect to this particular one i'm not criticizing the author in any way but it just says reducing inequalities features in lots of the policies you know i mean that's if we are looking at, it, at the policies, obviously that's across all of them, um, and, it, and it's trying to make a statement. But um, I've seen examples, and, and sometimes a visual representation of something, a bit like the donuts that we shared yesterday, can really help people to sort of focus in on thinking of what impact, um, particularly around equity, very quickly. That then means it's highlighting an issue. Let's look a bit deeper. Um, that we can maybe just look at in the future as part of an overall impact assessment. I know the HEAT tool is being discussed as in the inequalities and engagement uh, committee as well, but can I recommend that we yeah. look at that as a process of development? Very good. Thank you. Okay. All done. Let's move on. Thank you, colleagues. So I'm now standing between you and your lunch, so I'll try and, <clears throat> try and keep it compact. So item 13 is about the integrated care partnership. So where I think we're at in that is, is that um, 
the two councils uh, and the NHS, along with um, the third sector and Health Watch, effectively have agreed um, the membership. Um, just looking, we're, ne we're nearly right on the website now um, as to who's on that. Um, Linda Taylor, who is the um, leader of Cornwall Council, and I will co-chair that. Um, and what's really important about it is that it's actually going to be a 50-50 membership. So it really is equal membership between the local authorities, both of them, both councillor and officer on that side, um, and also the NHS as a mix of uh, executive and, and, and non-executive uh, and also a representative from, from the provider side. Uh, in terms of its roadmap to getting signed off, uh, three groups need to sign that off. Uh, us, uh, and therefore I'm expecting that the terms of reference that's being worked on at the moment between the councils um, and uh, through Trudy's office at the moment on, on our collective behalf is making great progress. Uh, the idea is, um, I suggest truly what we do is we, now you know who's, oh, you've known for a while, who, who's on that from, from this board's perspective. So for example, Margaret sits on there. I think we should do the courtesy of making sure that everyone who sits on that, who's on that here, so it's principally Neil and Margaret and the executive group. Uh, I think you should just share that, get that out. Um, so the idea is, is that we, we take to the 14th of July our NHS ICB view of that. And then as we go through there, somewhere between there and the 28th of July, which is the date in the diary for the first meeting of the Integrated Care Partnership, will be the signing off by Cornwall Council and the Council for the Islands of Scilly, with, I'm hoping, the same terms of reference that gets circulated with you before we actually get to Friday of next week. Um, because I have to say, our, our colleagues in the Council who have helped lead us on this to a fantastic piece of work, because it's as difficult getting this through your monitoring officers uh, as it is to our own go corporate governance team. So I really appreciate uh, the local authorities uh, support in weaving your way through local government uh, legislation as well, which is, trust me, if you think the NHS is difficult, try, try meeting two, two local authorities as well, and trying to then come up with a camel that doesn't look like a hedgehog. whatever. Exactly, hedgehog, yeah, exactly. So, any questions on ICP? <laughs> if you have, can you bring the answers as well? Um, <laughs> No, fine, thank you very much, that's, that's that update. So, I did want to leave, oh, only seven minutes, here we go. I want to leave a little bit of time, just to say, this is the public session, we'll have a bit more of a debate in the private session, um, but just, I wanted us to get into the mindset, even doing this publicly. I mean, how, how are we feeling about how this has gone? <laughs> Very helpful, sorry, Carol. Oh, okay. Has anything not worked for you, other than the thinking microphone? Anything else that's not worked? Miss Debbie. Yeah. Yeah. Barry. Uh, thanks, Chair. A couple of things. Um, uh, one, one, just small issue that sometimes I'm struggling to hear people, and yeah. it's uh, unfair in asking them to to shout and raise their voice. So yeah. that's just an issue. I don't know if that can be resolved in future. Um, more substantively, and I don't know if this is the right point to, to raise this, and if it's not, uh, perhaps at the start of part two, but looking at the agenda for part two, there are quite a few items on there. I don't see why they shouldn't be in part one, particularly around uh, accountability for finance, uh, and I'm surprised there are a number of issues in the agenda for part two that aren't in the agenda for part Good one. Good call. I think it's a direction of travel. If everyone's out for it, as much should be in part one as possible. Yeah? Is there any reason why it should still? going to come out a, a separate uh, point okay. rather than that one sorry so, i think that's the general direction of travel let's see to shut it down okay i think we're good if we go through and we say which of the items we think should yeah. have been in part one because i agree with yeah. so let's pick it up in part two and i'll look to you to sort of go why is this in part one okay cool thank you steve so i had a separate point and it's it's not a, a, a one for improvements it's just to acknowledge that this is a, a, a significant milestone. There's a huge amount of work which has been undertaken to get us to, to this position, and we covered some of that briefly on the agenda today. And I just want to say to, to Kate and her uh, previous chief executive role uh, in the CCG and in this role, the, the transition to establish the Integrated Care uh, Board organisation is, is a huge amount of work, and to acknowledge that, that's a, a significant step forward. Uh, but also, 
uh, John, to you, to the non-executive directors and to the executive directors of the, uh, the ICB organisation itself, this is a, a fantastic opportunity. I think the work we've done over the last three days has been an outstanding mm -hmm. preparation for, for this and it puts us in s such a position of opportunity going forward to address the challenges that uh, people in calling the Alza City uh, face uh, and I know we all know that but just to acknowledge that the huge amount of work and to say thank you to to colleagues to, to help us be in this position where we have what I think is an amazing uh, unique opportunity to move forward thank you that's really kind so yeah I agree and thank you to everyone who's done that anything else you'd like to reflect on so just before we break um, I want to give you half an hour's heads up or an hour's heads up about this type of discussion we might actually have later, all right? Because uh, I want to try and introduce with your support the concept of, we all know part one and part two. I want to try and introduce the concept of part three, okay? So part one, public, very formal, deep voice. I might put a tie on kind of thing. Uh, part, part two, eh, we're more friends, you know, let's have a chat. I'll take my tie off for that one kind of thing. Um, careful where I'm going now, because part three is about, <laughs> it's, it's, complete, it's completely, yeah, I wish I hadn't gone there, actually. <laughs> I, I bet you wish I hadn't gone there. <laughs> right. it's, it's more a question about how we, we function as a group. Formal board days can be very dry, and they can be very governancey and tick boxy and that kind of thing. And if you think about it, it's very difficult with this eclectic group of people to find time to come together and actually share some of the it ain't working for me, or I'm not feeling great about this, or that's not working, or what kind of thing. And we don't create the time. So part of the idea behind part three is, is each time we meet as a formal board, is just to leave ideally an hour, but certainly no less than half an hour, depending on the agenda, certainly half an hour minimum, just to be able to go around, because there is quite a few of us, you know, to be able to have that moment of what worked for you, what didn't work for you, and just to have a bit of a grown-up conversation. If that's okay, have a think about that. We're not going to have a very long part three today, because of the focus of today, but I'm going to ask Patrick to actually help us on a journey of going through here each board meeting, particularly in that part three, and contributing to helping form as a, a team in ourselves, if that's all right. Okay, so in terms of, thank you for that, let's close the meeting now, so that's, that's that bit done. In terms of coming back, um, we're back in here, can we be starting at 1.30, so I'll challenge you to be back by 25 past or whatever and sit down and be ready and champing at the bit to go um can i just there is another meeting that needs to play, take place who for and where and when non-execs martin Okay, so the, the, the exam question then for everyone is before you come back at half past, you need to have your photograph taken. Is that what we're saying? So will you hunt this person down and have your photograph taken? Just so I'm very grateful. But where are we then going and at what time truly do we need to be the non-execs? Lovely to see everyone at 1.25 then. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.